Uh, thank you for joining today um, as we um, talk about my favorite subject for a little while called operational excellence. And there's a lot to this topic. There are a lot of different um, approaches that people have to operations and uh, a lot of different environments or situations where one approach will work better than another. And so I'll approach this kind of wide topic with just some stories. Some stories about how I've done operations and I've seen others do operations through my 15 years at Amazon being a software developer. In these stories, you'll see a few themes repeat. Uh, first, we treat ops as an investment, not a cost. But better ops takes work. And so that investment needs to pay off over time. And it does, because when we do better ops, we have more time for building new capabilities. And at AWS, you're also counting on us to operate our systems effectively because you're running on us. So it's really a core part of our business at AWS. Second, organizationally, we align incentives for operational outcomes with the people building the service. I'm a software developer at Amazon, and I actually carry a pager, a physical pager. And so this is my pager. And so this isn't some kind of secondary or escalation ops rotation. This is the operations, this is the frontline on-call rotation for the stuff we build. Um, and, and so doing that has helped me understand what it is we need to do and prioritize to make, have better operational outcomes, what tools to build to make it easier to do it. But also, I think most importantly, it's helped me make better architectural decisions in the long run. Because I see when we make a certain decision or choose a certain technology to implement something, I see what that's gonna be like firsthand operating it over the years. Third, we regularly inspect and reflect on operations together. Ops is a cultural thing, and we need to do that often, and kind of it's a muscle that we need to tone and build over time. Um, it can't just be left unattended. Now, while there are some things that we do at AWS, I don't wanna just pretend that there's some just like magic wand that we can use out there that you can apply to any kind of environment um, to, to just make ops better. Uh, there's no one formula that you can just set and forget. It's a culture it's a, that needs to be fostered and adapted to a given situation. So when it comes to the, the exact specifics and routines and even tools, things even happen differently across Amazon, just to prove the point that it's actually, you have to adapt uh, operations techniques to a different environment. Um, there's no one playbook. For example, Within AWS, we spend a lot of our time uh, focusing on region build automation, a lot of our ops and development effort on that, because as history has shown, it's something that we do pretty often. We build out new regions and release them. But other, other parts of Amazon, and maybe for some of your infrastructure, this isn't really a business priority. You might not have the, the need to stamp out kind of new copies of your infrastructure on a regular basis. Now, on the other hand, we find that by doing this and being able to kind of stamp out a region, it has this ripple effect and other benefits where we can actually um, build out, because we can build out a region, we can also build out a test stack for each developer to use, or test stacks for chaos testing. So, you know, it, the different points of emphasis are helpful and, and apply to different businesses, and so there's no one kind of formula. You have to kind of adapt ops. So in, in thinking about how to best explain this operations culture at Amazon, I'm gonna share these five stories. The first three are these kind of habits or routines that we do over time, uh, actually regularly uh, at AWS. And then the last two are about some longer term investments that we've made, architectural choices and technology choices to improve ops. The first story is about the positive ripple effect that a single email can have. One morning, I was drinking coffee at my desk. We'll, we'll come back to the coffee thing pretty often, actually, in this talk. And I saw this email come in. And I opened it up, uh, and it was an ops win. Ops wins are notes that we send out broadly, very broadly, to celebrate success. There's no like gatekeeper to ops wins. Um, we just, these are just emails that we send out to, to share what we've found works well for us. And now this ops win dealt with an efficiency improvement. 
Uh, I don't, the, the team had actually found that they had some code that they could optimize. Um, and then so when they did that and deployed it out, it reduced their fleet-wide CPU utilization. And so then they were able to downscale their fleet and save money. Great. So I don't remember the service. I don't remember what service it was. I don't remember what the, what the specific efficiency improvement was that they did. That wasn't really the important part. The things that stuck with me, there were two things. First, it's just a, re a reminder that, that there's code that's ripe for optimization everywhere. And it's always a good time to pick that kind of low-hanging fruit. But second, I learned, and it stuck with me, that somebody had built a tool that made it really easy to find that low-hanging fruit, a sort of divining rod that people used to use to like find, think it was helping them find water or gold or something like that. But then, anyway, this wasn't a divining rod. This was actually a real thing. This was an always-on production code profiler. It's, run, it's something that runs all the time in the background alongside an application, and every once in a while, it just samples to see what the code is doing. It doesn't affect the performance of the application. It just does it every now and then, and it pulls all those samples together in the central location and then makes it so that you can go to a website and just whenever you want and just see what your, where your code is spending its time. So I kind of filed this email away in the back of my head until I had a little bit of extra time a few weeks later. And I kind of figured I would get one of, I, work, I worked on Lambda, I work on Lambda, and there was some microservice within Lambda, this thing that routes requests. Uh, it's not the thing that runs your code, but I figured I would try to deploy this, uh, this code profiler uh, and see where our code was spending time, do a little optimization. And so setting it up was relatively easy but it still required me to write just a little bit of code, a little glue code, in order to uh, get it running with Lambda, with the service that I was working on. So, you know, I didn't want other people to have to go through that glue code. It wasn't complicated, but it was still some time. And so I, I packaged up that glue code into its own thing and made it available for other people to use in the future. So great. And so from then on, once this was deployed out of production, um, I found that in the morning when I was drinking coffee, I would just pull up the latest profilers. I would go to this site. I would go to the, pull up the latest heat maps and find a little op opportunity for optimization that I could just do while I was having my coffee. And I would find just little things. It was a nice kind of idle distraction. I'd find some regexes to optimize or some like code thing to cache or something like that, little stuff. I prioritized the things that I could just do while I was just there, not really dedicating project time to it. And I think in the end, I, after a couple of weeks of, of this, every once in a while, I saved like 5% CPU or something. Nothing mass, it was good at scale, but um, nothing massive. But what this also let us do, by having this tool there, it let us identify and see the opportunity for those bigger code optimizations that would just take some actual scheduled project time. So we did those things as well. Great, so after you know, doing those kind of few optimizations, the packaging up the glue code, I sent out an ops win of my own. And that spread. You know, not, it, it spread and other people started using it and sending out ops moons of their own as they also made improvements. And then we found that this profiler was so helpful that we actually released this as something that everybody can use called Go Code Guru Profiler, just an AWS service. Um, now anyone that's running an application that's in Python or a JVM-based application can roll this out and browse the results of these, the code profiler while you're drinking coffee as well. Um, if you run in Lambda, it's actually just a couple of clicks to get this going. If you're not, it's not that hard either. That, that kind of like moral equivalent to that glue code is available as well. And so I can't draw a straight line from that ops win email to like the release of a public facing AWS service or anything like that. I'm not gonna make that kind of assertion. But the point of this story is to show the positive ripple effect that, um, th that this culture of sharing in ops can result in. Those successful practices get shared out and amplified and improved as people kind of innovate and, and send out new ops wins in the future. So there are kind of two takeaways that I think of from this story, this ops win story. First, creating a culture of sharing operational practices broadly helps other teams have that same benefit. And even over time, it's actually that they can benefit even more by innovating on that idea and sharing out again. And so like, as this happens, multiple teams, more and more teams inside your organization get that benefit. But second, I think the more, even more important lesson here, or takeaway rather, is that 
the ripple effect is, is beyond just a single practice that people get better at. This creates this culture that invites other people in to send ops emails of their own. So other people say, well, hey, I saw, that this, this, I saw this ops email. Maybe I should actually send this other ops win email about this other thing that I'm doing. Or maybe people will ask, well, what else could I do that I'd be able to share out and help other people with? Um, so it, it, it creates this virtual, virtuous cycle of improvement and creates a culture that focuses on and rewards operations. When these, like, these are large email lists with a bunch of people on them, and I see people, a lot of reply all traffic on it. It's really great, it's fun. I see very senior leaders kind of also chiming in and, and asking, like, oh, what, how can we do that too? So it's actually pretty, pretty great. Okay, the next story is about preventing an operational incident from happening again, not just in one team, but across the company and even for customers. The story begins in 2018, when I was back in the, still in the office, um, at my desk in the morning drinking coffee. Well, actually, I wasn't drinking it yet because I hadn't made it, so I was pretty groggy. And so it was time for coffee. I, um, I went over to the kind of kitchenette that's on the floor, the shared pot that anybody can brew, and so I brewed the coffee, came back five minutes later, had it, um, was still groggy after that first cup, so I went back, and I kind of realized, why am I still groggy? It's because I had brewed decaf coffee into the, the non-decaf pot. And so it's made this mistake. I accidentally brewed non-decaf uh, coffee. So I was like, okay, how, how could I have done this? How can I be expected to operate my production service if I can't even operate the coffee pot? Um, so, you know, and, and actually what I was, was really concerned about was did any of my coworkers drink decaf coffee without realizing it? Like, have, what, have, what have I done? And so, um, I, in order to keep this from happening again, I did the standard procedure after some operational event. I wrote a retrospective, or what we call at Amazon a correction of error. So these are tools. Oh, thank, I, I'm, it's so good to be talking again with a live audience instead of just like at a camera for a couple of years, so thank you. Yeah. And so anyway, COEs are these tools that we use after an incident to kind of determined, really dig in and fully analyze what it is we need to do to prevent that class of incident from happening in the future. For a deeper dive on COEs, uh, there's actually another talk to watch from a couple years ago done by Becky Weiss, a senior principal engineer at AWS. Um, but let's explore this coffee COE um, to see kind of how it fits into this kind of cultural theme of operations. When we write a COE, it helps us learn and improve our systems. But a big part of them is, a big part of why we write them is to share uh, those lessons with people who own other systems and help them prevent issues in those services as well. Or even more ideally, we can bake those improvements and guardrails into the underlying tools that everybody uses. Have, so people have some higher level of abstraction that prevents the issue without people having to do any work or do at least as little work as possible. And so a part of that lesson sharing culture is enabled by writing the summary. It's the first part of the COE that you, get, that you look at. It's a summary, and it, the summary is written in a language that assumes the reader doesn't know anything about this, your service. And so this is, it, it involves removing any kind of jargon or acronyms, and even putting in short descriptions of what the service is and how customers use it just to give that context. And it feels a little silly because it's your own thing, it's your own team, like, yeah, we know what it does. But it helps it so that other people who don't have, don't have that context can also learn. It also helps people who aren't on your team yet. So when people join the team, they can read these COEs and come up to speed on what the system is, how it works, and why it works the way it does, how you've changed it over time to, to get to the point where it is now. So it's a really good learning tool for, for people joining the team too. But now the summary isn't typically what we write first because it takes the process of writing the COE to write the summary. But uh, it's sort of like a conclusion that we kind of come back to over time. The part that I tend to start from when I write one of these is the customer impact. Because the customer impact section, you know, we kind of quantify things. We say, okay, how many customers were affected? How many weren't? In what way were they affected? What did, how did this actually affect their applications? And the reason we do this is because we want to minimize, or reduce, eliminate impact if this thing ever happens again. Obviously, we also want to prevent it from happening again. Some things are just the inevitable things, but that can happen, but without, we can actually make it so that customers don't even know that it happened. 
So for my decaf coffee retrospective, you know, I didn't really know how many coworkers were affected. Um, I didn't have a good data collection mechanism. So maybe one of the actions for the COE is, well, next time we could figure out some way to get that impact data a little bit better. For a service, it makes more sense for this. Obviously, we didn't do that. So I, then the next section of the COE is the graphs and timeline section. Uh, we kind of write a detailed timeline and we get all the operational graphs and metrics that we can. Um, I didn't have graphs in this exact case, but before that, when I was on the AWS IoT core team, I had wired up a coffee pot, the coffee pot on our floor there, um, with some photovoltaic sensors, just to kind of play with the IoT service and understand what our customers were seeing better. But so I actually had an IoTified version of our coffee pot, um, and so maybe one action item that I could have it was to make it so that like you could get notifications when there was coffee that was done brewing, and you know we of course have published CloudWatch metrics and everything like that. It's pretty neat. So maybe an action item for this COE is that well we could get better impact metrics if we you know, use, put a new version of that IoT sensor on our coffee pot or something like that. And then we could get, from those graphs, we'd be able to see the exact impact start time. And it's important to have that, those kind of data points, um, and, and we kind of put them together in a timeline written like this about when things happened, when we knew when things happened, when we kind of realized it, and then when we did anything, when we changed something. So having these kind of things listed out all in a chronological timeline, you know, actually maybe some of the things from the timeline for a really interesting event, maybe the timeline starts well before the incident, because like really interesting incidents have kind of a lot of things coming together in order to make the kind of perfect storm. But the reason we put these things together like this is so that we can look at the different phases of an event. Like if we see that there was a lot of time, we can quantify it. If we see there was a lot of time before we kind of detected something, then we would know that our alarming is off and that we need to make our alarms more sensitive, add better, better alarms. Um, if there was a lot of time between detection and figuring out how to mitigate, then we need to figure out better diagnostic tools that we can use or run books or something like that. And if there was time from knowing how to mitigate to actually mitigating, well, then that means there's some other class of things that we need to do to help figure out how to minimize customer impact. But having this quantified in that timeline helps us, helps us see where to, where to tackle in the most important way, more fruitful way. So then we get to the part of the COE that I, is really useful for thoroughly, thoroughly analyzing an event and digging into what the right actions are, are to take. And this is a... It's a way of asking progressively, asking why, 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 why. And so here we don't focus on, well, why did an operator do that thing? You know, that's, in, instead we focus on, why was an operator even needing to be in that situation in the first place? Uh, for example, in the coffee COE, I didn't focus on, um, you know, like how I messed up or anything. This was just about how to remove a human from the loop or to add the guardrails so that it doesn't happen, so that they don't do it, or so that if it does happen, nobody drinks that coffee. So we ask, you know, why, and like that why might not really result in any kind of interesting answer, but it might result in an interesting question. And so we'll ask why again, and maybe that why results in, oh yeah, we should do this thing. And so we'll track that as an action item. And so we, maybe that should result in more questions, probably just not one answer to the whole thing. Uh, and that, that why can result in more actions. And so we also kind of summarize these actions that we're tracking in kind of lessons learned. And again, this is sort of a summarization for, to make it kind of these lessons more digestible rather than just looking at a list of, of things that we're gonna do. And so we keep asking why until we bottom out and figure everything out that we need to do to prevent this thing again. So this is really the meat of the COE. It's the whys, in my opinion, the whys, the actions, and the lessons learned. Another thing we do with COEs is look for where we can have broader application of those lessons. One way we think about this is, is with the kind of well-architected process that you all can use. We can do that too internally. The well-architected is sort of like a checklist that we can go through when we are launching a service or when we have one just to reevaluate re its, its goodness and make sure we're following everything that we've learned to be important over, the, over time. Um, or we kind of can see when, well, okay, what can we do here? Do we need to add a trusted advisor check? Trusted advisor is a thing and go and inspect all of your infrastructure to look for configuration that might not have the right outcomes. Like, are you maybe running in too few availability zones? Have some other, other you know, efficiency improvement opportunity. Trusted Advisor is a really nice tool that we kind of feed those lessons into so that we can prevent things from happening in our own stuff and for you in, by letting you know when you have something that you could fix. So the takeaways of this story, 
I think, that, or that detailed retrospectives help us dig in and learn and improve our systems and their, uh, the operational practices around those systems. Having, this, having a standardized, regular template helps us make sure we don't miss anything and we really bottom out and get to the bottom of what we need to do to improve. Second, retrospectives help us teach each other and prevent outages in each other's systems. So we kind of publish them broadly for new team members, we put them in a searchable database so that other people can find them and see them and learn from them as well. And so that people who own central tools and systems can see what kind of maybe traps people are falling into to, uh, to make the systems themselves easier to operate safely. So one important thing here is that we're thinking big beyond just the team or service who is impacted during the event. So we can make the, to the underlying tools that people use safer. The next story is about propagating operational best practices and reinforcing ops culture across AWS. We use a lot of dashboards uh, at Amazon. Even for the same system, we just have tons of dashboards. Some we use maybe more in incident response for a particular region, uh, zooming in on a particular microservice. Um, others we look at more holistically to see kind of the end-to-end -end customer experience for something. These exist to make sure that we have the graphs that we know are useful and important at our fingertips really when we need them, but also, they're a curation of what we know is important to our customers, and we need to look at those on a regular basis. So for a deeper dive into dashboards, check out this other Amazon Builders Library article written by John O'Shea, who's another principal engineer in AWS. So these aren't things that we just dust off occasionally. We look at these all the time. It's another one of those things that I look at every morning when I'm drinking my coffee. It's just a you know, fun thing to get back in the context and see how things are going. But it's not just this kind of ad hoc coffee thing. We actually spend time on a regular basis, every week, as a whole team looking at dashboards. We look at the graphs and we use the graphs to talk about what customers are seeing in that given week, in the last week. Now, graphs aren't the only thing we talk about when we get together like that every week, um, but graphs are a big part of it. We also use these to celebrate the ops wins that we talked about, to kind of have some discussion about them. And we also look at the key retrospectives and so we can dig in and learn together, um, not just like in case you missed an email, you actually we can talk about that. And it's important to do it as a whole team and to talk about it because we dig in together and share our different perspectives about it. We call these our weekly ops meetings. And now while each team does this on their own, we also have an ops meeting every week as all of AWS. All of the AWS development teams get together and have this same agenda, um, and we share our perspectives. Now it's like representation from each team every week that rotates around, but like anybody can join, a lot of people, it's a huge meeting. But we do things like uh, go over ops wins. We talk about the ops wins, and kind of that gets people thinking about how they can adopt those same practices. We have a curated set of retrospectives from the previous week to look at and investigate. We kind of pick the ones that are the most applicable, have the most interesting broader lessons. And we also spend the rest of the time just looking at dashboards. Um, somebody, the way we do this, we can't really just look at every single AWS services dashboard every week. Um, but what we do is we spin a wheel. The wheel has all the different services on it. We spin a wheel and whoever kind of shows up will, um, on the wheel, will kind of walk everybody through and teach, all the, teach the rest of AWS about um, how they think about operating their service and show through metrics and graphs and everything like that. And then other people from AWS will ask questions and comment and make observations and drives a really interesting discussion about how everybody operates their services. So for example, like when we, we're, we're kind of, when, when, I'm, when we're looking at each other's metrics and dashboards, we're all kind of coming at them from our, our own perspective, our own unique perspective and our own experience about operating services. One engineer, for example, named Graham, uh, is known for asking questions uh, about uh, graphs that look like this. So maybe on this graph, there's some kind of alarm threshold that's up here on the graph, and then there's the kind of general operating characteristics of that metric down below. And so Graham will kind of, it kind of goes like this. Graham will say, hey, you know, that alarm line is a bit higher than the typical operating characteristics of that metric. What would customers think about if the performance went up to that line and then just, just below the line and then stayed there? This is just an interesting kind of provocative question. 
Um, now the answer is like, to, uh, just to play through this discussion a little bit, the answers typically go like this. It's either, oh, we actually have a multiple alarm thresholds. One's more sensitive but takes multiple data points to breach, so we would know. Or maybe the answer is, oh, actually, we, uh, we had an ops win recently, uh, and so we reduced, we reduced the latency or something like that and improved the performance. And so what we need to do is, or maybe they already did, uh, is reduce the alarm threshold to the kind of new uh, performance characteristics of that, of that metric. So, like, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting discussion that we all kind of learn from. There's another story I remember about these ops meetings. This one was just the, within the Lambda team. This wasn't the AWS-wide one. And we were talking about the, one of our microservices, that same one that routes requests. And there was this availability dip some, in some, somewhere. And um, the on-call said, oh, yeah, there was this, this alarm that went off. Turns out it was some, our software on one of our EC2 instances. It was acting weird, so I took it out of service. And they said, oh, yeah, by the way, this wasn't impacting customers. They were, like, they kind of confirmed it through the other metrics that it, with all the retries or whatever that we had in, it wasn't in customer impacting. And they said, okay, yeah, this was just one instance. I took it out. It was fine. Let's move on. But then somebody said, hey, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that. Because one thing that's nice about doing this together every week as a team is that we have this collective memory about what's going on. They said, hey, we've been actually having that issue. It's kind of happened more than once recently. And sure, maybe it's not customer impacting, but it's on-call impacting. It's annoying. Let's, again, maybe we should, like, so what's actually going on there? And the person said, well, yeah, you know, it, it took a little bit of time to find out which instance was having the problem because we have a lot. And so there's a lot of metrics to sift through. It, took, it just took some time to, to, like, to recover, the, or not to, to find the bad instance. Because it's kind of a needle in the haystack problem. Oh, yeah, it's that one, right? It takes an on-call a little bit of time. And so the person said, hey, actually, for our other microservice in Lambda, we have this tool that we use. It's a, a thing on our dashboard that says, it's a widget that says, per, like, for the top 10 servers, or top N servers, which is the one with the most, which are the ones with the most errors over time? And they had these for other, these top end metrics for other things. And they explained how, actually, we could put this on our dashboard and then it would save us time when we were responding to one of these events. So neat, kind of just sharing of practices. I'm gonna share that practice with all of you. Like, this is actually something you can do with CloudWatch Contributor Insights. If you have a very high cardinality metric, like something per instance or per customer or something like that, you can actually use CloudWatch Contributor Insights to get those uh, without having to have one metric for every one of those things, and it just shows you the top most. You can actually do a lot of other things with it, too. It's pretty handy. Now, the epilogue to this story is that over time, we actually, well, we even said, hey, let's, let's take this and make it so that an on-call doesn't have to do anything. And so we built some automation. We actually built a service. Because we kind of saw this happening, we built a service whose job it was to look at contributor insights and find an instance that was having problems and, and take it out automatically. Now, just as an aside, if you're going to do this, this has to be done very carefully. Because what you don't want to have happen, it has to kind of be as smart as a human about this. It's not going to say, oh, I see 100% of my instances having this problem. I'm going to remove all of them. Right? Like, it can have a, ne a negative ripple effect that you don't want to have happen. And, so, and that's a very real concern. So like, it's something that we built in from the start to this system. Um, it's a, this kind of whole idea about health checks. You know, typically, load balancer health checks would be taking these servers out of service right away, but you know, there's, we can, it's a deeper topic that you can go into in this uh, Amazon Builders Library article below um, if you're interested in digging in on the idea of health checks and automatic recovery. So this story is actually just more about the team paying, together, paying attention to operations together looking at graphs, asking questions, having that collective memory, and sharing what we know about best practices and good, effective practices for operations just by talking about it. And so by reviewing dashboards and asking questions like this as a team, it helps us make changes to, better, to like make changes to maybe add better instrumentation and visibility into the system and so that we can kind of turn this flywheel. This is a flywheel where you turn it, um, it improves operations. And so the more often we do this, the more we, we can ask, we start asking better questions, new questions, and just as we kind of fix things and improve things over time. So by doing this together every week, it gives us more and more opportunities to turn this wheel and improve operations. So the first takeaway about the ops meeting is that we use this to learn from each other. 
I give the example of, of Graham kind of pointing out that thing about the metric and an interesting discussion that happened. And sure, like, that is an interesting discussion that might have made one improvement to one graph or operational thing at one point, but that's not maybe the in most interesting part. The interesting part is that everybody else observed Graham ask that question. And so everybody else learned that, hey, this is an important thing in operations that I should be looking for and question that I should be asking about other services. So it's this nice positive ripple effect when more people start asking the questions that the, and emulating the things that we see in that larger meeting. Second, uh, diving deep into ops every week as a leadership team and everybody together d demonstrates the priority and sets the culture. This ops meeting isn't the only way that this happens for setting that kind of op operations culture, but it's an important one. It's um, something that we do on a repeating basis. It's an inspection that kind of happens regularly by everyone. The next story is about a time when we set one big North Star about adopting continuous improvement, continuous deployment, excuse me. And this resulted in improvements in many other operational practices along the way. This story starts way back about beyond 10 years ago now. Um, we had plenty of tools that we used as developers to build, test, and deploy our software. Um, but we found that despite those tools, it took on average, across the company average, 16 days between code check-in and deployment to the production. And 14 of those days were just kind of waiting for people to shepherd the change along between running tests, deploying between different test environments and that sort of thing. So some teams had built up some automation around this, but what we saw was an opportunity, an opportunity to improve things broadly and improve, like both improve the time, the agility and, and the time, to, the pace of innovation to get things to production, but also reduce the amount of effort that it took from developers along the way, which would then also increase the pace of innovation by freeing up developers to do that. So the answer to this, uh, it was setting this North Star goal, saying, okay, we're all, everybody in Amazon is gonna be deploying through pipelines. But in order to do that, we had to make a pipelines tool. So that was the first step. And so um, it was just a tool that you could set with configuration how your deployments should walk through different test environments and what tests should be run. Um, and by the end of this, the, the kind of first pilot team um, using this saw a 90% reduction in the overall time from code check-in into production. So it worked. And so this is a great story, but, but this is actually, it took a lot of effort um, it take, from every team in order to get to the point where they could do continuous deployment. And so this story is interesting because of those ripple effects. It wasn't just the work that they did made it so they could do continuous deployment. The work that they did improved operations in other ways too. So for one, a team who was adopting this had to actually build higher quality test automation than they had before. So a robot can't make judgment calls about like, which manual test was being flaky and is normal and all that stuff. It, 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 it can't run manual testing steps for you either. So in order to get to the point where you had deployments running automatically, you had to actually improve your testing practices. And that took time, but it resulted in better quality and more time back for developers going forward. So once we had this pipelines thing in place, um, it, yeah, it kept our test standards high. Like we no longer, teams could no longer have flaky tests because they would block pipelines. Um, and so it actually helped us just overall improve the quality. So for details about how we think about like kind of test automation and deployment automation, check out another Amazon Builders Library article by Claire Ligori, a principal engineer in AWS. So the second ripple effect is it helped us be more formal about the deployment practices that so many teams already had. Like first, teams would deploy to uh, one server that maybe doesn't even take customer traffic and run, we run tests on it, and then we put customer traffic on it and make sure that it's okay before we deploy to the next set of servers and so forth, next availability zone. All these practices that people were doing, we could codify and just make them the standard and also make it so that when somebody comes along for a new service, they could just take that configuration and use that in their own service and they would already have the best kind of way to be doing these deployments. So another, another uh, ripple effect here is that it helped teams with rollback automation. 
So we already had like automatic rollbacks. When alarms fire, any alarm fires, we roll back and all that sort of thing. But because developers knew that there wasn't going to be a human around to do that rollback and execute that rollback, it made it so that the code changes we made were easier to operate because they would be automatically rolled back. For example, this comes down to little things like uh, content type negotiation, version negotiation, like just doing protocol upgrades in a, in a safe way. It was safe before, but it took manual steps, maybe going forward and backward. And so now by formalizing it and knowing that your code's gonna be going forward and backward without anybody in the loop, people were just more, more structured about it and intentional in, at development time instead of thinking about it during deployment time. Another Amazon Builders Library article about all this kind of interesting upgrade, downgrade testing. So one really interesting ripple effect actually with this project was because things were modeled and, and structured, they could be inspected. And so we could actually continuously improve our deployment best practices company-wide because we can analyze and see what practices every team has and we can make recommendations. Think like that trusted advisor thing we were talking about. We can look at somebody's pipeline and, and as we learn something new, a new practice that is actually safer, better deployments, we can just let everybody know, or better yet, modify everybody's pipeline for them, and that type of thing. So by having this structured, we can, we can actually you know, analyze and make recommendations as we learn new things and new practices over time. So there are two main takeaways of this like, continuous delivery story. The first is that having a North Star rally point around continuous delivery resulted in faster deployment velocity and freed up time for developers so they could innovate more. But it had this ripple effect of improving all of these other things that people had to do in order to get to that. So having this kind of North Star goals that are kind of broad, it's an easier way to kind of convey the message of operational excellence around. Like for example, region build off automation that I was talking about at the beginning. It's a way of, of like having this goal that also improves our infrastructure automation, improves our test environments, and all these other things. So look for those, those kind of North Star goals because we found that to be pretty useful. Second, this stuff isn't free. Like this stuff takes investment. Um, you know, it's, it, it takes upfront building that better test automation, but it pays off in the long term because it, it, it frees up developers. We know that the cost of operating a service outweighs the development of that service over time. So we look at those investments that we can do earlier on to save time, save cost in the long run. The last story is about how the Lambda team reduced its operational costs by building a part of Lambda on Lambda itself. So here's how that works. So one of the, several, one of the services that I've worked on, as I've mentioned, is Lambda. And if you haven't used it yet, just here's a real brief kind of description of how it works, and it kind of ties into, um, you kind of need to do this anyway. So um, Lambda is a service that runs your code without needing to think about kind of what or how many servers it runs on. So you upload your code by calling this create function API, and you say, okay, here's the code that I want to run on it. And then Lambda has that code ready to, to use whenever you then call your function. And so Lambda functions can run in response to many different types of triggers. Um, so for example, you can call just the web service API, like, and call your function by name, and it'll run, it will kind of spin up the right in, uh, infrastructure, run your code, and return what your code returned. Or it can run in response to other things, like you can have it run whenever, say, a CloudWatch alarm goes into alarm, you can run a Lambda function. Whenever an IoT device sends a message, you can run a Lambda function. And so over time, we kept adding more of those triggers and more event sources. Um, so you can actually configure Lambda, like a newer type of these that we were adding over time was where we actually can run things in response to SQS, Kinesis, or DynamoDB. Now these, these are actually a little different and we had to build these, these uh, event source things a little differently um, because we took these types of things, DynamoDB, Kinesis, and SQS, need us to go out and get those events for you. It's just a kind of under the hood, unimportant uh, thing, but it's kind of just behind the scenes, but it's worth mentioning here because we needed actually new kinds of information from customers in order to be able to pull those. Because, so behind the scenes, there's this fleet of servers um, called the Polar Fleet. And these are going out and getting those events from that event source, like going and asking DynamoDB, hey, are there, have there been any changes to the DynamoDB table? Have any items been inserted? And so once it gets one of those back, it actually, our polar fleet then turns around and invokes your Lambda function for you. 
So doing that, like I mentioned, needs some information from you. We're, since we're going and calling another AWS service on behalf, we need some configuration about what to call, how frequently, the permissions, and that sort of thing. So you call that by calling the control plane API. Um, I don't know, and so I just needed a graphic for it, so I wanted a plane. So anyway, it, uh, so you call the control plane API. It's just kind of a one-time setup thing. And then the Polar Fleet from then on has the configuration it needs to go get events every now and then and call your Lambda function. Okay, fantastic. So when we were building this, we just needed to implement a few of these simple configuration APIs. That's what all that kind of background is about. New service, how to implement some APIs. And so, but when we were building this, we realized we had kind of a couple of, a fork in the road, a couple of choices about how to build this. We could either build these new APIs on an EC2-based service like we were used to doing. It was a well-worn path for our team. Like we knew how to do it. We knew how to operate servers, do all the OS patching, the scaling, um, just all the other kind of deployments. We knew, how, we knew what we were getting ourselves into with that. Um, but since we are the developers and the operators, we've re remembered like, oh yeah, actually that's gonna, you know, we know how to do it, but it's not particularly pleasant. So one thing we could actually do is since this isn't actually part of Lambda, it's sort of this side thing. I mean, it is part of Lambda from your perspective, but when it comes down to it, going and getting events is not the act of running events. So since these were separate systems, it would be still be statically stable for it to, to depend on Lambda itself. And so we did. We built the pullers and we built the, uh, the control plane on Lambda because and it has been able to help us reduce our operational cost over time because we knew in, long run, in the long run, it was worth like paving that path. Like it wasn't more work, it was actually less work, but we, it was different work because we would have to pave a new path that our team specifically hadn't done before. So the investment was just learning a new thing in this case. So this story is a pretty short story. We built some customer facing control plane APIs uh, on, of Lambda on top of Lambda. The, the interesting part here is probably more of the takeaways though. So one key takeaway wasn't actually in the story. Um, in, in order to be good operators and developers, we need to kind of understand and empathize with what our customers are seeing. And sure, operationally, we talked about how we do that by, with all those dashboards. We're looking at the metrics that represent what the customer experience is. We have synthetic workloads running that do what customers are doing so we can monitor that client side kind of stuff too. So we have all that. But how better to empathize with the customer experience, including the development experience, as being customers ourselves, like for real, not just demo applications, but being production service users of our own service. So it was pretty great. That, that actually was an interesting kind of side takeaway here. The other takeaway, though, fits into the theme of that we align incentives for operational outcomes with the people who are developing and building the service. Because developers are gonna personally feel that cost of operations in the long run, so we make architectural decisions and choose technology that's going to reduce that operational cost in the long run. So these were five stories about some of the things that we do around operations at Amazon. But to summarize, I'll try to categorize the, th the takeaways into three different categories and then offer some kind of practical takeaways for things that you could try out. First, operations is a cultural construct. Uh, there are some specific operational challenges that can be solved with technology, but the broader idea is about how operations is having a strong culture around it with emphasis, the right emphasis and habits. So we do this regularly as a, as a whole company um, with the weekly ops meetings, and as a team and with the whole company. We also look for habits that are self-sustaining, like the ops wins emails, where people send ops wins emails and then they see them and they're invited in and they think, oh, I'm gonna send an ops wins email too. So this self-sustaining cultural habits. So we kind of, we have those, those habits that are self-sustaining. Second, we make sure that there are closed loop processes to keep problems from repeating in a particular service or in any other service. We look to make sure that those lessons are shared and adopted by even our customers through things like the well-architected framework and trusted advisor. Uh, we talked about the importance of using a retrospective to kind of feed as inputs to those things um, and, and make, actually make the underlying tools that everybody is using better. And third, we consider operations as an investment rather than a cost. And we look for ways that we can do more short-term investment that will result in longer-term, longer less cost. 
We talked about North Star goals, like the adoption, everybody's going to do continuous deployment as ways that have these ripple effects that don't just do that one business outcome, like worst case, sure, everybody has less, easier deployments, but they have these ripple effects that reduce, improves ops in other ways as well. We also talked about um, other types of investment, like, okay, instead of getting paged and having to deal with failed servers, let's make automation to, remove, to not have to do that at all. Or how it was an investment to pave a new path for our team and learn how to do serverless within Lambda, but they paid off. So that's all pretty abstract, though, in some ways. Um, I'm sure maybe you've been thinking about how some of these things apply to your company, your organization, or team. Maybe they don't, maybe they do. Um, but here are a few maybe practical things that you could consider trying and see if they work. So first, you could create an ops win email list or Slack channel or something, um, and just start sending things out that you're proud of, encouraging other, maybe seeding these things kind of can take a little bit of work, like encourage other people that when you see something that's great, be like, hey, could you send that out? Um, it, maybe ghost write or something. Now the key is though to get a bunch of, get everybody subscribed and this is sort of the power of defaults. You could consider just subscribing everybody to that email list or something, I don't know. But you could just get that kind of bootstrapped so that they see if that kind of, if people start, start sending out their own best practices and wins. Second, you could do a retrospective for an outage in some, one of your systems and see if there's, um, and, and share it broadly. Like, you know, be proud of your deep dive and introspection on an event and show everybody, like be kind of lead by example and show how, how thorough you can be at getting to root cause and teaching other people. Or if you already do that, maybe you could um, make a template to help you know, other people do things in a, in a methodical way when they're doing retrospectives. Or create a searchable archive so that people like, who are new to the company, new to the team can read them or how people can search and look for trends. Another thing you could try is set up a recurring ops meeting uh, for your team or larger organization. Um, if you already have one or one kind of way to do it, it might also be to, in the, to spread that culture, could be to invite experts that you know outside of your team as kind of guests and be like, hey, could you kind of come to our ops meeting and, and, tell, and kind of weigh in and chime in and see what you think? See if that kind of gets going. You might find some North Star goal, for, like and that's another thing you could do, is find a North Star goal that is, okay, we can do this one thing, like continuous deployment, that's going to be, it would be good if that happened, but it could also have all these positive ripple effects because it's going to be a long-term goal. It's not something we can just do in a month. It might, it, it might take us quite a bit of work, but it's good to have that North Star kind of as a thing that we're gonna keep working on over time and improving over time. Or you could just simply ask your team or ask other teams, hey, like, what would you do if you had a little bit more time? If we deprioritize something, are there even just these little things that could improve operations and make life a little, little better? Because there might actually be some like low hanging fruit like that where it's just actually pretty easy to do things. So with that, thank you for joining and spending some time just thinking about operational excellence. Um, looks like we actually do have a little bit of time for questions here, um, so we can, if anybody has anything, um, we, can, we can do that. But, and if we, if we don't get to your question or if you think of something later, I'm happy to chat on Twitter, so just uh, message me there, or since you're here in person, message me and we can kind of find, a, we could even meet up, say, at the serverless networking lounge or something like that, uh, just around the corner um, at some point today or the rest of reInvent. I actually have some free time. So um, one last thing, though, um, you know, we've been doing these, I've been doing talks at reInvent for like a long time and like 10 years now, I guess. And one thing that is true is that we use these surveys to make sure that we have the right talks that are relevant for you and that we do them well. So please do fill out the survey. Um, and so thank you for coming. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, in the middle there. Got it, so the question was how do you get started like maybe with like one of these ops, uh, ops reviews, like the op weekly ops meetings? I mean, it sort of depends on your role. Like it, it could be like that you just, I mean, if it's within your team, just send out a weekly meeting and you know, maybe get the teams by and be like, hey, let's, let's try this. One thing that I find that's nice with, with these types of things is to treat things as an experiment. It's like, hey, let's try this and see if it works. Set the agenda. It maybe means doing a little bit more work, taking on more work yourself to kind of curate things to talk about. Um, that could be it, uh, and just making sure, you know, just making sure we have a good agenda um, and that type of thing. That's, that may be a good, it's sort of just, just tr 
start, try it, send it out. And, and that, I think th I've seen that teams like kind of appreciate that kind of just technical leadership of like, okay, let's try this new practice. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah. So I guess the question is sort of how to, how to start a flywheel for that incremental improvement. Um, I mean, it's really just, it, it's a cultural thing. So I think, I, I think I'd just start small um, in terms of like just, I, I guess I don't really know the starting point. Um, uh, I, I think just, yeah, just start, start small, like start celebrating everything that, that people are doing and invite them to do it more. That's sort of like, it, in, in terms of like just creating a culture, it's just like, it's all about just finding people who are doing something and excited about it and inviting them in and amplify it. Like really it's amplifying voices. You don't just want it to be you doing it. It's all about bringing people in so that other people are doing it too and so amplify their voice when they are. There may be people around who are already like that and doing it. So just give them a, give them a stage, you know. Uh, yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. All, the question is, uh, do all engineers at Amazon wear pagers? Um, well, yes, with an asterisk. Uh, so we actually do have technology that's more modern than pager technology. Um, <laughs> uh, so a lot of most people use just like an, an application on the phone that we've made that that pages in and make sure like oh if you have your phone on silent it'll still page you when you want it to that type of thing. Um, so yes, we have on call. Like every team has on call rotations. We all we all are on call for the stuff that we build. Um, that is universally true. And I, I think that model works really well. And I, I know there are a lot of models out there. I don't know. Um, out of, I mean, just random curiosity. Um, how many of you are on call? And or not now, but like I hope that you're not on call right now. But uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty much everybody here. So I mean, maybe selection bias, given that this is like a talk on operational excellence. But um, yeah. Anyway, um, any other questions? Yes, over here. Uh, so how does kind of that all up, all up really work? Like, like, uh, how does the global, the, how does the big ops meeting work? Just because everybody's globally distributed. You know, we try to find, a, it's at a time when that works kind of for, for most time zones. Um, it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, we do it all. Uh, so, so how does it work? Yeah, it is. It's all together. You know, it's uh, just a, we we do like to have some. We make sure that there's there's somebody who's kind of on point for keeping us on on track and everything like that, and making sure the agenda's set ahead of time. Um, but yeah, that's. I mean, it's just a big. It's it's a big meeting. Anybody else? Okay. Well, anyway, it was really nice chatting. Um, sorry if I'm missing a hand or anything. The lights are pretty bright. Happy to chat more. Like I said, hit me up on Twitter if you want, and we can uh, meet up. Have a good reInvent, everybody.